Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. I'm at the China Institute in Manhattan for the celebration of Lunar New Year. Here at the Institute, there's a special contemporary art exhibit on Year of the Dong Huang. Dong Huang are the sites of ancient caves dating back to the 14th century in Western China. Many of these caves contain some of the world's finest Buddhist art and shrines. Today, they're the inspiration for 15 contemporary and modern artists whose works capture the beauty of these hidden gems. But first on our show, a look back on the life of Private Danny Chen. It's been almost three years since the U.S. soldier committed suicide, a victim of military hazing. I spoke to his family and local officials about the impact of his death and also changes made to prevent this from happening again. Every day, Suzan Chen and her husband pray in front of the shrine dedicated to their son Danny. It's Chinese tradition to honor a deceased family member with an altar. There is a photo, a candle, food offerings to Buddha, and their son's favorite drinks, all reminders of a life taken too soon. Um, every day she misses him a lot. And recently, Danny's birthday and also Mother's Day has passed by, and everybody has a, has a child for them to say Happy Mother's Day to her, but there's nobody there to say it to her. Danny was born in New York's Chinatown in 1992. He was the only child of Su Zhen and Yan Tao Chen, both who immigrated from China. They remember Danny as a happy child who dreamt of becoming a police officer. It was the reason why he left college after just one year and signed up for the army. <laughs> She's, she still misses Danny a lot, and she remembers everything about Danny, and that they have been the best sons of them. But Danny soon found himself in a hostile environment, not from the enemy, but from his fellow soldiers. No, he never said anything about what happened to him in the military. The only time um, he called, three, the three times he called, uh, all he asked about was about their health. In one incident, he was dragged over 50 feet of gravel, causing bruising and other injuries. It was all too much for him. On October 2011, he shot himself with his own military-issued rifle. His death served as a rallying point to community activists, shining a light on race-based hazing in the military. The family has been through absolute hell. To give them some measure of closure, they must have the right to be able to face those who are found guilty. Eight members of his platoon were charged with various crimes related to his death. Two were sent to prison, the others discharged. In response to Danny's case, New York Senator Kristen Gillibrand and Congresswoman Nydia Velasquez introduced the military anti-hazing bill. President Obama signed the bill as part of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2013. Now, almost three years after Danny's death, after months of rallies and collecting signatures, a small victory for the family. In October 2013, the city council passed a resolution to co-name Elizabeth Street between Canal and Bayard, not far from where Danny grew up, Danny Chen Wei. City council member Margaret Chin called the vote a vote for tolerance. And I think the struggle that um, he went through and what happened to him and how the community and his family together uh, worked so hard to fight for justice for him. I think that is something that we want people to remember and to get to know Danny. Councilman Chin has been an advocate for the family since the beginning. I'm really proud that the community spoke out and the family uh, because we knew that a lot of these incidents happened you know, to other families and you hear about it, but nobody was willing to come forward to say something. So in this case, uh, the community um, asked for answer and the family was not afraid to come forward. And I think that Danny's parents were so courageous, uh, especially his mother, um, that she was willing to have her heart broke 
again, again and again. Every time she came out, you know, whether it's press conference, rally, uh, city council hearings and meetings, I mean, she had to go through the whole emotional, you know, agony again. It's been a long road for the family and their supporters, including OCA New York, an Asian American advocacy group. OCA's Liz Oyang has been with the family fighting since the beginning, a vocal supporter at numerous press conferences and hearings. Danny Chen Wei memorializes the community grassroots campaign for justice and the unwavering belief that all soldiers who fight for America must be treated with dignity and respect. For Danny Chen's supporters and family, it has been an emotional three years. The trials, the rallies, the press conferences, and the hearings. Their hope is that Danny Chen Wei will be a reminder that a tragedy like this will never happen again. I'm Tina Beth Pina. American consumers are becoming increasingly diverse, and ads on television, in print, and on billboards recognize the evolving face of our nation, but unfortunately, not as quickly as many of us would like to see. It's been over 40 years since Coca-Cola debuted one of the most iconic ads in television history. Unfortunately, the commercial, which featured a racially diverse, non-stereotypical cast, didn't start a multicultural advertising trend at the time. I wouldn't say that that commercial necessarily contributed to the advent of multicultural marketing here. Nevertheless, uh, it was a great commercial in terms of embracing diversity within the world. The idea of happiness and universal love hit a chord with Americans at a time when conflict was dominating headlines. According to Bill Amata, chairman and CEO of the IW Group, what's going on socially affects what we see in the media. Well, usually some social unheaval will impact advertising. And we're seeing that history kind of plays itself out over and over and over again. So the civil rights movement impact the way we look at African Americans. Cesar Chavez and, and, and the United Farm Workers changed the way we look at Latinos. Sometimes it requires that spark, that catalyst, to get companies and corporations and ad agencies to change. For years, many print and TV ads perpetuated stereotypes, depicting African Americans as servants, Native Americans as savages, Asians as coolie hat-wearing subordinates, and Latinos as bandits. The Frito Bandito ad is an, is an ad that kind of sticks with me uh, for a long time. I think that that was really a catalyst along with the ad, Aunt Jemima ad um, for the community that we cannot continue to be portrayed as servants or as heavy set people riding donkeys. The ads of 40, 50 years ago made use of what were then prevailing stereotypes which now we can look back on and say, that was bad. How do you get shirts so clean, Mr. Lee? Ancient Chinese secret. First of all, the Calcon ad was not designed to, to build relevance with the Chinese community in the United States. It was designed as what we could call a mainstream or a general market ad. They were used as a creative device. And that is probably a good textbook example of uh, taking a stereotype. Nowadays, stereotypes aren't as apparent, but still exist. How good are advertisers at depicting realness? Well, in the past, in the not so distant past, you always saw Asian Americans as doctors, as pharmacists, as engineers, or worse, as ninjas, or, or geishas, or karate experts. Fast forward 20, 30 years later, you're now seeing Asian Americans, Latinos, African Americans in new roles. You might see mixed race kids. I really like that Cheerio ad, and I thought that was a, a real milestone. And we're seeing a lot more of those types of ads. Ads are taking their cues from census numbers. Over 300 million people live in the United States, according to the last census report. And they estimate that by 2042, ethnic consumers will make up more than half of the U.S. population. African Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans already have a combined purchasing power estimated at $1.9 trillion, 
while the purchasing power of Hispanics alone is at $1.2 trillion, larger than the economies of all but 13 countries. 90% of the public recognizes that the United States isn't white America anymore. It's a multicultural country. Mm -hmm. And most of the people that are here are sons and daughters of immigrants or people that immigrated here many, many years ago. And if you look at just the Asian American population, we've had double digit growth in 49 out of 50 states. Asian Americans are now America's fastest growing ethnic group and have become a powerful economic force as well. The group's buying and spending power is more than the average American household. With the growth of the Asian population, you know, we're talking almost 60% growth between 2000 and 2013 in mm -hmm. uh, spending power that's going to exceed $1 trillion by 2017. Um, companies are beginning to realize this is a population that they cannot ignore. Currently, the ad industry has set the standard for portraying Asian Americans positively, casting them in mainstream roles in commercials for McDonald's, Best Buy, and Target. Do you think the ad industry is ahead of the game? Yes, I, I think the ad industry is ahead because it's a lot easier to produce a commercial than it is to produce a full-length movie or a television program. Uh, but the ad industry over the last probably five to six years have really led the way in changing the way we look at consumers mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and providing that level of diversity that is absolutely needed. Consumers like to see that, hey, here's a product or service that people like me would use. Now, I think some of the diverse groups in this country are used to not seeing themselves portrayed. So when they do see themselves portrayed, they feel like they've just received a hand engraved invitation to interact with that brand. It makes a huge difference when people see themselves in ads. We have seen, for instance, in a variety of ads, whenever there's an Asian American in that ad, Asian Americans, regardless of whether or not they say that uh, they care about this, immediately notice that there's somebody that looks like them in an ad. And that actually increases the level of interest in that particular company and their services and products. Getting the right ethnic perspective can be tricky. And recently, the Advertising Education Foundation has been visiting college campuses to encourage minorities to pursue careers in advertising. With more diversity behind the scenes, we're far more likely to see more diversity on camera. For Asian American Life, I'm Tina Beth Pina. I'm Kyung Yoon, and coming up on Asian American Life, they say beauty is skin deep. But when it comes to plastic surgery, not everyone is seeing eye to eye. He said, I cannot represent you unless you get plastic surgery to make your eyes look bigger. When television host Julie Chen shared these dramatic before and after photos and revealed that she had been pressured years ago by her then agent and her newsroom boss into having plastic surgery, her story touched off a firestorm of controversy and conversations around race, identity, and beauty. I think it is certainly brave for her to come out and talk about it, and I think it's a uh, Eyelid fold is a very popular surgery among Asians and uh, I mean when you go out there and see Asian, pa Asian people in general, a lot of young girls are getting eyelid fold done. I, I think it's sad that you can't embrace the, the, the uniqueness of yourself as an individual. In the end, when you, you know, fix your eyes to be a little bit bigger, your nose to be a little taller, um, and your cheekbones to be <laughs> thinner, you, and you do end up looking like everybody else, right? Has individuality given way to cookie cutter standards of beauty in this age of plastic surgery? That was a question that swirled around the contestants in the 2013 Miss Korea beauty pageant. Honestly, there are trends where there's smaller face tends to be the trend right now, more V-shape and smaller smaller facial structure, so people are going for that. Plastic surgeon Edmund Kwan of New York City is renowned for his expertise in Asian ethnic surgery. You know, I don't think necessarily by doing plastic surgery you're making all the 
Asian patients look the same. Everybody has different facial features. I'm trying to just enhance those features. Among such enhancements, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons says that eyelid surgery to create a defined fold on the upper lid is the most popular cosmetic procedure among Asians in America. Some call it westernizing the eyelid, but Dr. Kwan says it's not about changing ethnicity. Asian eyelid fold surgery is not westernization. I think that's a complete misconception. Honestly, a lot of Asians naturally have an eyelid fold. My approach to Asian patients are, number one, I want to keep their ethnic identity. I think it's very important. Patients come in, whether they're Chinese, Korean, Japanese, or Southeast Asians, they all want to continue to remain looking Asian. So my philosophy really, number one philosophy is to maintain their ethnic identity and uh, just simply make them look better. Jenny, a potential patient in her 30s, is considering eyelid surgery to make her eyes appear more symmetrical. It's something that I've always been kind of adamantly against. However, I'm now at a point in my life where I'm inconvenienced, and so I'm looking into potentially having the eyeful surgery so that I can even out uh, both my eyes. So you can tell I have one here, right. but this one, for some reason, it doesn't really set. One person who says she has never considered plastic surgery is musician and former fashion model Jihae Kim. She has graced high-profile ad campaigns for fashion companies like Eileen Fisher and Banana Republic, and even created a music video about models. In an industry governed by certain rules and ideals of beauty, Chihe sings a different tune. I never felt pressure to get any kind of plastic surgery to fit in. For me, it was more wearing more heels to feel taller and exercising a lot to, be, to, to keep fit. I think if they wanted to find a Western-looking model, they will go find a Western-looking model. My concept of beauty is a little bit deeper than skin deep. I feel like when you f meet someone who's very comfortable within their own skin and who is very confident, that is more beautiful than the most beautiful face that's uncomfortable in their own skin. But how much of this comfort level is shaped by cultural cues on what is attractive and what is not? Julie Chen says that it was after being told by her boss that her so-called small eyes made her appear disinterested and bored that she began to self-consciously obsess about this facial feature. And all I could see was my eyes and does he have a point? Or is it perhaps the same issues of self-confidence that affects all ethnicities everywhere? When they look at a mirror, if they have really flat bridge of the nose, Honestly, they think about that all the time, and that could be depressing, and uh, it sort of occupies their mind at all time, and you know, when they meet people, they tend to sort of shy away. So I feel like it boosts their confidence, and it boosts their, certainly their self-image. When I put a nose implant, and I, I find that some of these people become different people, literally different people, and you know, they, they were there all along, but it just wasn't coming out. Julie Chen admits that sometimes she's wondered if she made the right decision to go under the knife under pressure from a boss. But one thing she says she's certain about is that the surgery did not make her feel or look any less Asian. And that's an identity she wears with pride. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. Up next, we'll take a look at the microbrew beer industry and meet one brewmaster who pairs Eastern and Western flavors. Our Paul Lin joins us from Queens. Basil and his business partner, Kevin Stafford, both longtime home brewers, quit their day jobs in 2013 to focus on beer. Now the brewery is their only commitment. Yeah, that's good. I think, you know, we're starting out with a couple of beers, three beers really for distribution. We're going to have uh, an IPA for sure, which we love, and that's really uh, one of the first reasons or first craft beers we fell in love with. We're going to do a smoked porter and then also a Szechuan peppercorn wit beer, which we call double sesh. But yeah, we've definitely gone all in. Um, I left my job back in May as a graphic designer. Uh, Basil left his job as an architect back in October. We've been working as hard as we can since June. 
Not only did Kevin and Basil go all in with their own money, they also made sure they had support from their community. A successful Kickstarter campaign raised over $30,000. It's exciting. Um, you know, it's great that people are behind us and, you know, we've gotten a ton of positive feedback from neighbors and everybody who's uh, contributed to the Kickstarter campaign. Finback is part of the great craft brewing surge, not just in New York City, but across the U.S. There was an 18% increase in the number of small independent breweries. Sales of craft beer jumped double digits. By contrast, overall beer sales, including the biggest brewers, were little changed. So that's the backdrop for Basil and Kevin's entrepreneurial dream. At this point, they're brewing up some European-style beers and others like the so-called double sesh with a unique flavor profile. You know, it has Szechuan peppercorns, uh, which is very interesting, with very floral notes. It's not like black pepper at all. It's a kind of numbing spiciness and a very floral kind of sense to it, and as well as ginger, some chamomile. And the idea there is to make a really refreshing kind of summer beer. Basil's taste sensibilities trace back to his parents' Chinese restaurant in Rhode Island. His dad came from northern China, his mom from Hong Kong. My father had a much more kind of, in a way, earthy flavors, spicy flavors, when you think of northern foods, really rich flavors, you know, much more fatty and sweet foods, versus my mom being in the south, much more kind of bold, bright flavors, seafood, spicy flavors as well, but in a, in a different way. Beyond the palate he got from his parents, Basil gained first-hand experience when he traveled to China for business, bringing back some ingredients to try out in his beer. You can look at all this as a kind of cross-pollination of ideas that has gone on in the world of beer for centuries, and even longer. For example, this is Finback's IPA, but it owes its heritage to 18th century England. To preserve beer that was being shipped to India, brewers had to come up with something more highly hopped and higher in alcohol. It's known everywhere as India Pale Ale. From what we know from archaeologists and anthropologists, there have been fermented beverages in Asia since ancient times. But if you are talking more about what we now know of as modern beer styles, those first came to the different Asian countries with the first wave of European traders. The Dutch, by some accounts, brought beer to Japan in the 17th century, but it wasn't until the late 1800s that a Japanese brewmaster trained in Germany started the brewery that became Sapporo. India had a supply of India Pale Ale from England, but the first brewery came well later in 1855. China's Tsingtao Brewery was founded by German and English brewers in 1903. Other influences in Asia came from Russia, Czech, Denmark, and France. The taste of beer is why it ended up sharing the table with Asian cuisine. It's the way the flavors work together. We're here in Manhattan at restaurant Rue Thai to hear what one chef has to say. Jeff Hardinger is of Vietnamese descent. He owns this restaurant with his wife and her sister who are both from Thailand. Garnish it with a little bit of the rice powder. With all the flavors here, the sweet Some and the, the tart, powder. the salty and spicy, Jeff's beverage of choice is yum, beer. Yum, from beef. micro brews to Belgian saisons to That's traditional not, Asian not, yeah. beers like Singha Saison. or Sapporo. A lot of it is the flavor components in the food, you know, the, the chili and the, the strength of the flavor. Beer has that quench, you know, that you really want with, with spice. Talk about these particular beers. I mean, here you have one with a gingery sort of taste. Here you have a Belgian Saison. Uh, how does that come into play? I like the farmhouse. Some of the, the Belgian beers tend to be, um, they have too much grain, and they get a little, a little bit uh, soft in flavor, and it's a little too much. Whereas some of the ones like the farmhouse style and the pale ales, they're a little lighter. And I think that that really works with the food. It leaves you able to taste you know, the flavors of the food and not be completely overwhelmed by the beer itself. Some food, wow, a little that pad thai and a little red curry. Wow. And so in Asian cuisine, you can have many different flavors in the foods. There are many beers that can either cut, contrast, or complement that. You can have a, a simple, uh, great uh, European-style lager like Sapporo from Japan. You can have a very hoppy American-style IPA from Smutty Nose in New Hampshire. Or you can have roasty, chocolatey porters and stouts. Or you can go to the Belgian style with beers. Beyond the flavor inspirations that make beer and Asian food so simpatico, the social nature of the two things is a very Asian sensibility, the very act of sharing food and beer. It's something Basil Lee had instilled in him growing up with his family's restaurant. 
and I think that's kind of stuck with me throughout you know my whole life and in a way beer is kind of a natural extension of that you know it's it's kind of brings together the kind of creativity of combining flavors and also just the pleasure of creating something that you can eat or drink relatively quickly uh, and then you share it with family and friends and you kind of bring people together through either the food That's or the good. beer light and refreshing going forward basil and kevin plan to target craft beer bars and restaurants to build a following they also want to make Finback a destination and a neighborhood joint by hosting special events. I'm Paul Lin for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. Be sure to stop by the China Institute to see Year of the Dung Wong. The contemporary art exhibit will be on display through June. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. <laughs>